Hello and welcome to 11FS Spotlight. My name is David Bree, and in this show we shine a bit of a spotlight on the best and the brightest in the tech and financial services industry to try and understand what is it that gets them going, growing and what they think the future of the industry will really look like. On today's Spotlight, I'm delighted to be joined by Charles Dellingpole, who is the founder and CEO over at Comply Advantage. How's it going, Charlie? I mean, it's been a while since we chatted, isn't it? But it's uh, lovely to be able to talk to you again today. It's great to be back, and so much has changed since, right? It has, yeah. I mean, we would have been doing this face to face, but obviously, like pandemics, like we, we were chatting World War Three, like all of these things that are just kicking off. It makes it uh, makes it difficult to align schedules, doesn't it? Exactly, exactly. And on today's show, we're going to be talking about many of those things, actually. We're going to talk a little bit about Charlie's career, uh, the current state of cyber fraud in today's ever-evolving tech landscape, and a bunch of other things that we're going to be looking at as well. And we're also going to be touching on, if you haven't seen the the recent Netflix shows, the the Twinder Swindler, the uh, Inventing Anna, and, and actually how fintech security innovations are are really transforming actually how people can respond to these things and help people to stop being frauded. I'm not sure being frauded is is good. Is that good word wordsmith there, Charles, or is that a, is that a bad way of framing that? I'm sure we can make it happen if you want it to, to happen, right? Fine. All right. We, I, I feel like if uh, and what we need less is more buzzwords. But uh, if being frauded is going to be a thing, then let's talk about being frauded. All right. Let's let's start off. Uh, can you give us maybe a, a little bit of a, a background for anybody who's been living under a rock? Tell us a little bit more about Comply Advantage. You guys have been tearing it up the last few years, haven't you? Yeah, and I think super relevant for your audience um, in terms of many of your clients um, or admirers are going to be companies or people who want to start insurgent new banks or fintechs or lending platforms. Um, the, there's obviously a huge overlap between um, the companies you work with and we work with. So we work with probably about 2,000 fintech payment companies, banks all over the world. Um, and principally, we help those companies to not launder money, not send money to sanctioned Russian oligarchs, um, and ultimately stay out of jail. So um, huge overlap there. And um, as a company, we're now around 400 people. We've raised $100 million. Um, we work with some some of the best companies in this space. Um, and it's an honor to be on your podcast. Well, it's that's, a, that's an amazing... I mean, when did you start the company? Um, so... I started this company, um, this is my third company. So I started a another fintech company um, called Market Finance back in 2009. And in building that, I encountered some of the problems that I'm hoping to solve with, with, with Combine Advantage. So um, lots of companies try and defraud you as soon as you start a kind of new fintech. Um, you have to register as a money laundering reporting officer in the UK. Um, and all these fintechs want to try and grow their companies. But in the back of their minds, they know that if something goes wrong on the AML front, then then they'll go to jail. So um, that was really the kind of problem that I wanted to solve with Comply Advantage. Yeah. And it's amazing, isn't it? How often, you know, that that spark of wanting to start a business is from feeling the problem for yourself in that sense. Um, what what makes Comply Advantage different from the the competitors then? Because obviously, I mean, the the fraud space uh, is is huge, isn't it? In terms of, as you say, the the amount of fraud that happens on a day to day basis. The bigger the company are, the the more of a target those those organisations are, and that's particularly relevant for you know fintech startups that are, are growing to a decent scale. But um, you know, what, what do you think is your your key differentiator that people should turn to you as opposed to to somebody else in the market? So the reason I started the company was because I didn't feel as though um, the incumbent solutions had solved the problems. And that was because of the architecture that they had adopted. Specifically, um, there were companies that had attempted to build databases of people and companies, um, which could be a high risk threat because of their sanctions, their involved in money laundering or terrorist financing. And they were doing this with hundreds of researchers. Um, whereas what we've done is build it via algorithms. So you could see how machine learning, AI was coming up. And so if you want to keep track of all 9 billion people in the world and which ones are a, a threat or have done bad things, then the only way you can do that is with algorithms and technology because as soon as you've finished, you have to start again. So really the kind of core differentiating factor was that we basically built everything by technology. Um, and not just the underlying data, but also things like the search algorithms or, 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 or the case management um, platforms and techniques, kind of the full end-to-end -end stack. And then 
we expose that to the clients directly via API, or also we have um, a large chunk of our business is via partners. So there are many identity companies um, who offer sanctions, PEPs, Abbas Media, who are reselling um, the underlying data that we have. So um, in terms of being the global de facto source of risk information, um, that's part of our strategy as well. So really it's doing everything from scratch anew and doing it better than the incumbents have done it with the researchers. Yeah. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, we, we talk about digital a lot and actually the idea that, uh, you know, people just sort of digitize that setup. You know, you, what you're doing with, you know, algorithms and, and you know, a couple of hundred smart people is, as you say, what a big organization like a Wells Fargo or a Citibank would literally employ thousands of people to to, to keep on top of. Um, and that doesn't sort of get to the point of the real time nature of the world that we really sort of live in. So, I mean, obviously, this is hugely relevant. You know, we're increasingly moving towards digital. There are you know, various different hot topics when it comes to, to to fraud that's out there, both in terms of, you know, we talk about the, you know, what happened on Tinder and, you know, the inventing Anna thing. And obviously you touched on everything that's happening with uh, the the sort of Russia situation, the the war that's, that's uh, uh, I don't know if I say imminently brewing or, or very much brewing in terms of the, the sense that's there. So, I mean, this feels like a topic that increasingly is going to become relevant as digital becomes more and more of a, a mainstream thing. Yeah, I mean, I was at a fintech dinner last night and um, someone that I know says, hey, um, I have a lending business and a key part of that deadline came from a now sanctioned Russian oligarch and therefore I have the problem of having to be able to freeze all those issues um, and, 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 and funds that have been dispersed already. Um, and so if you have a very large client base, like we work with companies like Affirm or Upgrade or Oak North or eToro, all these companies have tens of millions of clients. And each day they have to figure out which of those tens of millions of clients have been sanctioned have been involved in sex crimes or environmental crimes or violent assaults. Um, and so for those companies that are building those fintechs or, 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 or platforms, um, by far their largest operational cost is going to be understanding the underlying risk. And so what we're trying to do is help them figure out every day which clients have to be offboarded, but also on the behavioral detection side as well, um, perhaps those entities aren't known and haven't been featured in a Netflix documentary. And therefore those companies, um, perhaps they start by sending money to like Iraq, Syria, to, um, or, 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 or kind of, there are various typologies that are indicative of potential account takeover or, you know, so like if we're running a FinTech or a bank, it's very challenging to understand the underlying dynamics of what's happening in your company and where there are risks. So. Really, it's about helping those companies discern and then act upon those threats. Mm. And and you touched on, I mean, obviously the the accountability for doing these things. I mean, there's a few there's a few acronym acronyms in there. Like, um, just unpack what PEPs are, because for for everybody listening, they might not be aware of exactly what those those types of screenings actually are there to to in order to prevent and then touch a little bit on accountability because when it comes back to you know the accountability of the business to do these things it very much falls on the the organization doesn't it so you know this isn't something that i think small organizations can worry about later this is something that very much sits square with that organization to get right from the get-go yeah so um great question um firstly in terms of the kind of acronyms and the underlying data types so if you take the former owner of Chelsea, Roman Abramovich, as an example. So he starts off as a kind of low-level business person. Maybe he's been accused of fraud. Maybe he's been accused of theft. Um, and that's the adverse media, right? So, um, and that would be the same bucket as Tinder Swindler, as in people get accused of crimes, of, 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 of bad behavior. So what we have is a kind of... Um, I think 100 million pages a day in 20 different languages that we're feeding in and collating into profiles. And then you can monitor your underlying client base to see which of those entities are subject to adverse media. And then if there was a Daily Mail headline saying that you, your bank or fintech was banking that entity, then you want to be ahead of that. So that's adverse media. And so a brand which then goes from being um, a low-level tycoon to being 
the kind of tycoon that's linked to Putin, and therefore he becomes a governor of a Siberian province like Kamchatka or, 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 or whatever the name is. Or, or, or perhaps you become like Evgeny Lebedev, you become the lord of Siberia, um, who, who's the current evening standard um, owner, right? So, um, and once you're a lord or you're a governor of a province, then you're a politically exposed person. And Peps, um, as they're known, are like stars in the sky in terms of the more you look, the more you see, as in probably three, four percent of the population will be Peps. And there's local councillors, there's government bodies, like it isn't just people who are in parliament, right? It, it, it's kind of stretches throughout the entirety of society. When, when say, Russian troops go into Bucha, they want to look at the mayor, they want to look at the council, um, and they want to murder everyone under the age of 40, right? Then, so so those people would be at risk of corruption. Um, they would be potentially exfiltrating funds. Um, if you're Sonia Abacha in, 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 in Nigeria, then you're exfiltrating all, all the money. So, um, and so you begin with adverse media, then you become politically exposed. Um, then perhaps you're on a warnings list um, at which there are thousands and thousands more um, for, for, for other bad behavior. Um, and then finally, the final piece of that life cycle um, or, or that kind of chrysalis before you become a, a fully blown sanctioned entity is, is um, a government body, as you've seen the past few weeks, um, post February 24th, um, we'll, we'll, we'll put you on a list. And that's an asset freeze and a travel ban. Um, and so perhaps many fintechs have Russian money from um, all these oligarchs that we that the people thought were safe um, and now aren't. And so there, you, you, you aren't allowed. You, you aren't allowed to have the person travel. You have to impound their yacht. Um, you have to um, you have to look at their house in 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 in, in Mayfair and and lock that up. And finally, if you have funds, you have to somehow figure out what to do with them because you can't hand them back because that money ultimately would go to some sort of nefarious purpose. So, um, so that was the first question. Um, um, I'll stop there and let you. Um... No, no, I was, I was going to say I think the uh, the magnitude of that in that sense is so significant because actually to that elk i mean it's interesting obviously and and we've sort of you know talked a little bit about obviously what's happening uh, in the ukraine but actually the the significance of traceability of and and evidence ability of who you're doing business with both in terms of the people you choose to bring into your business and this you know the these the knock on impact of this as you say from a you know an, an oligarch perspective is not just a you know have we given them a current account it's like actually who are we taking on as investors in organizations who are you know funding the foundations of, of growth for those those people increasingly you know both i think customers and entrepreneurs want to you know, associate with organizations and people that really reflect their values. Um, so it's, I mean, in one sense, it's like the 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 Tinder swindler stuff, like it's a old fashioned confidence game. You know, people have been conned out of some money and yes, we there's things that could be done on that. But on a much more global scale, the, the things that are now, you know, coming out around, it, it's sad that it's taken a war for us to then go, yeah, maybe maybe the Russian oligarch situation is not right, and all of the things that have been happening are, you know, probably a, you know, why do you think it's taken as World War Three for us to to get so outraged about this? Because and and I should should add as well, I mean, you know, these examples are are the extremes, but fraud is like a major problem even on a minor scale for you know you any of the regulators globally that you talk to about this it's the kind of like number one problem that they see you know aml fraud and uh, their inability to actually track and trace and everything around that is is the number one issue because to your point this isn't just well money's leaking out the system it's where is that money going and what is actually happening with that because what that means is we're we're continually legitimizing bad money in a financial ser services industry which is set up really to to help people live their day-to-day -day lives. So I, I guess breaking that down to a question, Charles, why do you think it's taken such a dramatic course of action or a you know World War Three for people really to to stand up and go, do you know what, maybe we should be looking at where this money's really coming from? Yeah, I think, great question. Um, I think in terms of um, World War Three and Russia, I think really in some respects, it's nothing new. Um, 
I think last year it would have been Jeffrey Epstein. The year before that it would have been Syria, Venezuela, um, North Korea. I think um, part of what is fascinating is that there are always new geopolitical hotspots or threats. So back in 2014 when I started, um, I was working with a company sending money to Afghanistan, Pakistan, Somalia. So you had Al-Shabaab, Taliban, ISIS. Um, you've had all kinds of issues um, with the Syrian war. You had um, chemical weapons problems. You had the invasion of Georgia. So I think um, I think it isn't just that. It's the Bataclan attacks um, it, um, in, 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 in Paris. You have cryptocurrency. So I think the, the underlying trend is people are thankfully becoming less and less tolerant of evil behavior. And um, whether it's geopolitical, whether it's um, different moral behavior, whether it's environmental crime, I think society as a whole wants to crack down upon bad behavior and make the world a better place. And a key mechanism and vehicle to do that is finance. And I think your, your eloquent question spoke to some of the key dimensions that like makes finance professionals greater finance. It's the underlying mastery of identity, credit, fraud, understanding your customer, being able to act upon that. Um, of course, there's like sales and marketing, but I think the really core cool operational part of, 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 of fintech, which really is the secret source behind many of the company's success, is really understanding what's going on behind the customer. And with everything moving online into digital formation that there are really whole new ways of understanding that and the amount of sophistication and um opportunity that exists i think is part of what makes this great for companies like 11fs in the terms of there are really so many opportunities to be seized um and the, the underlying threats around um bad actors um are also huge as well. And um, really to have the technology and systems and expertise in place to do that is what makes great companies great. That's that's hard, isn't it? As you say, the digital's a, a bit of a two-sided coin, isn't it? For every opportunity it gives you to to serve the customer better, it gives uh, you know bad actors opportunities to try and exploit that, doesn't it? So but but I guess in that sense, I mean, how do you how do you from from your organizational perspective keep on top of that? Because I mean obviously the uh, you know, bad guys are pretty good at this. Like it's a, it's a reason that they've been successful in the first place in terms of, you know, being able to either, you know, three, you know, three degrees of separation away from the things that they're doing or, you know, ha this isn't just catching Jimmy Carr kind of like uh, having some offshore funds and it being, you know, not not quite great. These guys are a, a professional level in terms of the, the, the bad acting that they're doing. So, I mean, how do you guys as an organization pull together different disparate data sources and, and structure around that in order to to constantly try and stay ahead of the game? Um, great question again. Um, so, what we're doing is looking at underlying data sources. So we're looking at um, the kind of sanctions, perhaps Amazon Media that, that, that we spoke to beforehand, but then also we're pulling data on corporates and shell company ownership and directorships. And really we're trying to keep track of all different data sources possible. Um, then we're looking, um, in terms of those categories of data, we're looking at structured, unstructured, semi-structured data. So we're pulling in the kind of 60,000 sources of PEP data. We're pulling in every conceivable government website. So we're looking at the FBI website. We're, we're hopefully being able to extract um, in every single language, every single entity um, in terms of um, crypto exchange was accused of fraud. We'll pull in the names of those directors, the shareholders. Um, and then um, we want to be able to then collate all that information and be able to have clients categorize it as well. So, um, so if we have 20 million bad actors in the database, the key thing um, in terms of the fintechs and banks that you work with is um, how can you make that efficient and effective? So the real challenge is if you have, say, 20 staff, you want them to be reviewing and offboarding the high-risk entities. And so um, the kind of cliche terms are false positive, false negative. So you only want to be looking at really bad threats. You don't want irrelevant alerts. And so the, the real challenge is being able to collate all the information, um, resolve all the entities, um, but then also find hidden risks. So if you have 
extremely high value customers being on board, let's say um, for a private bank customer, then this person, David Brer, might be fine, but then um, he might be linked to like a terrorist group or a sex trafficking ring. Um, and so while I want to be really clear, I'm not just so anybody yeah. listening to this. <laughs> just so, just before that tweet goes out, then uh, I'm I, you know just to be I mean, clear. So I, I, I'm reading this book about the Sacklers and Purdue Farmer now, and you can see for the first like 15 years, the Sacklers managed to sponsor every gallery in the world, every art institution, but kept their name out of the limelight. But then what we're trying to do is connect those hidden names that actually are the power behind. Um, drug trafficking firms or other equally morally problematic entities and, 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 and show companies and people the risks that they aren't aware of. So I think um, a core thesis for us is the kind of algorithmic detection of risk is superior to human detection of risk. And you, you can see the, the progress that NLP libraries are making in terms of the advances OpenAI are making. So, so I think really it's, it, it's bringing that to the um, financial crime world. And then also I think um, the question you asked, I think two questions ago was about how we can democratize access to that. So we also have a program called Comply Launch where we give free access to everything we have to early stage fintechs. Because I think ideally you want the small insurgents to have the same tools and weapons available in their arsenal as the large incumbents. Like you see like, Bank of America, so some of these very large companies, these people have $30 million in, the, in, in their own internal teams and their spending. So I, I think we want each new fintech, each new bank um, to have those tools out of the box for free, um, such that um, it isn't necessarily an area where companies compete in terms of every company shouldn't be laundering money, every company shouldn't be financing terrorism or different oppressive wars. So I think um, I think the democratization of this technology to early stage companies for free um, is also something that we're very proud of as well. That's amazing. I mean, uh, I sort of said earlier on, uh, from the beginning of the foundations of a business, this type of stuff needs to be built into it, not just from a, you know, not just from a technological perspective, but from a, the mindset of everybody in terms of establishing that business. So, I mean, that that's huge then. I mean, you're, the uptake of that there's nobody nobody turns down free do they especially if the products uh, products great so um i mean that how does that scale because obviously in that sense you know as organizations get bigger the complexity and arguably the target gets you know more significant in terms of it but you don't have to be a huge company to be the the sort of weak link in the chain do you if you're if you're not up to scratch if you're not up to standard in terms of doing these things they're the places that people will really look to to exploit in that sense yeah, it's an arms waste. It's kind of it, 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 it's a kind of whack a mole type type. Um, the, the whole Alice in Wonderland, um, Red Queen, simply running to stand still is a huge challenge. In terms of the same tools and techniques that that we have are also available to um, the adversaries who are trying to launder money, um, and therefore what we want to do is. Um, be able to invest in 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 these tools such that we can keep up with, with the new techniques being used. So, particularly in the Russian sanctions that have gone through, you've seen um, different oligarchs have transferred it to their nieces. Or I, I think Putin um, has um, his childhood friend or a violinist who have um, 100 million dollars in their name, and they obviously didn't get that from being a great violinist right so um so, so i think it's kind of hidden risk whereby it's relatives close associates family members of politically exposed persons we have to have those too so i think um it's a constantly never-ending arms race of technology legal structures data and we have to be able to invest to stay one step ahead which is why i've raised 100 million dollars and have 400 people working on this now yeah. I mean, that, that was going to be my next question really is like, what's next for Comply Advantage? Because obviously in this space, like you say, this isn't a, a product you build and then you're done because of the ever evolving landscape that you guys operate in. So, and a hundred million sounds like a hell of a lot of money. If you kind of, uh, if it was all in your bank, that would be a lot of money, right? But, yeah. but in the sense of actually, you know, hiring the talent, expanding out geographically, uh, I mean, this is a, a constant fight you're having to fight. Yeah, I think... Um, what we're trying to do now is really 
enhance the core product in terms of if you see a David Brer, you want to have every company linked to him, every person linked to him, every second degree connection, um, the entire timeline. Um, you want perfect zero zero false positives, 100% true positives. So, so I think really um, we're trying to invest in things like the Chinese, Japanese, Korean name matching, um, expanding coverage of data sets like um, the Yakuza in Japan or the different Arabic name maps. So, so I think even though I would argue we're the leader in this space, I think this technological path we're following is still very fertile in terms of the incremental improvements we can put on the core platform. Um, and I think we should still be able to deliver step changes in terms of output and um, innovations which help clients for a long time to come. So, um, and the underlying problem is only getting bigger. We're also a small player in the overall context of this in terms of there are other big companies that other incumbents haven't switched to. So I think um, I think there's tons of potential for what we're doing. And even though we're now um, a decent size, I think we can still grow far, far larger than we are today. Yeah. I mean, it's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, investors always look at, and clearly, you know, for, for 100 million raised, you know, investors always look at the addressable market, right? Uh, the addressable market for this is is massive and getting getting more massive. Another another bad use of English on my part there. Yeah. Um, but but I, I think that's the, you know, scary but exciting thing. And and actually for, for normal people just sort of walking around on the street, they don't really sort of see all of these things. Yes, they see the, the Abramovich stories in the newspapers. And yes, they sort of see everything that's sort of happening out there every so often with, you know, bad people doing bad things. But this, the, the sort of underlying hidden side of this really does affect everybody's lives, whether they really know it or, or, or not. So um, I, I kind of want to roll back a little bit. Um, and, and actually, we'll, we'll sort of you know, wrap pretty quickly because I know uh, I know you've got places to places to be and things to do. But I mean, you you touched on earlier on. This is the third business you've started. I mean, that uh, that's pretty damn impressive in itself because the those companies have gone on to do you know pretty amazing things. I mean, was this the thing that you knew you were going to be doing in terms of being an entrepreneur and and founding multiple businesses, or you know, what what did you start as a little boy thinking you wanted to do? Um, I think. Um, I love working on like ambitious projects with great people that has like big impact, right? And I think um, as long as I'm doing that, I'm kind of happy, right? I think in terms of the, the, the challenges we have in terms of um, being able to implement technology in terms of dealing and meeting with some of the, the, the kind of leading fintechs and, 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 and companies in the world, um, I, think, I think to be able to build a great team and hire and work with amazing people is great. So I think like, um, I think most people would enjoy enjoy this. And um, I think fundamentally, um, yeah, I think it's a great way to contribute to society, right? So I think um, for the moment, it, it's um, great fun. Yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a weird one as well, right? Founding founding a business, being the CEO of a business, I mean it's a it's a lonely spot, right? You uh, the kind of buck stops uh, stops and starts with you in terms of that uh, responsibility and everything that goes with that. I mean, how how do you manage that balance between them? Because obviously, uh, you know, like I say, being the CEO, everybody wants to be the CEO. It sounds amazing, but it is quite a lonely place when you've got that level of responsibility. So, I mean, how, how do you keep yourself kind of uh, in check in that? And, you know, how do you balance the the multitude of thousand things that you've got to do on a day to day basis with, you know, the, the, the positivity that you need to 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 move forward? I think every company reverts to the kind of core model of having a great board, a great C-suite, right? And I think um, we've got Index, Bolton, OTPP, who have been amazing on our board. Um, in terms of the exec team, we've got a great new CTO, CPO. You know, like These people know far more than me about building companies, um, building technology. Um, so I think um, really they're the ones running the company on a day-to-day basis, right? So... Um, I just hang out on on podcasts and um, <laughs> hey, that's chat. my job. I got to that's yeah. a, you got to got to got to add something somewhere, haven't you? But uh, but I, I you know I completely agree with that. Hire smart people, try and get out of the way, right? I, I guess um, as we're coming to the end of it, and and actually, seen as you've been through you know three businesses, you know obviously you're got a long way to go with with Compliant Advantage. You've learned a lot, I guess, in terms of 
done things slightly differently each time you've, you've built a business and scaled a business. Um, what would be the one piece of advice you'd look back on and uh, right at the beginning of this, this journey and give your younger self? What would that be? I think um, people rush into starting companies and I think um, the, the kind of project you choose and the focus that you have um, on the project is critical. And you think, oh, I can start off in this one place and then move somewhere else. But, but actually, um, I think taking time to really explore the market, understand precisely where you want to begin. Um, because I think a lot of companies, like I, 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 I've also like invested in 140 fintechs and other companies now. And I think, um, yeah, I think, I think um, pivots really do take it out of you. So I think like a lot of thoughtfulness over precisely why companies are choosing a particular architecture or problem to solve or um, team to begin, like I think the underlying DNA of a company um, is formulated very early on and very difficult to change. And I think getting that right is critical. So I wouldn't necessarily rush into that before you're ready. It's it's interesting that isn't it that that early period like as you say forms so much of what you grow up to be. I mean, uh, from Eleven FS's perspective, it was our sixth birthday yesterday. So like happy happy birthday. Bir- happy birthday to us. And actually, like as part of that, I went back and looked at the the first Google Doc where myself and Jason and Simon and Ross and the team were sitting down and going, "What do we want to be when we grow up?" And actually, that core purpose still comes through in everything that we do on a day-to-day basis. So you've got to, I think I, I always kind of go back to these things don't happen by accident. You've got to do everything on purpose. And actually, if you're if you're on purpose, actually is a good purpose. And in your instance, with what you're doing with the Comply Advantage, there could be no greater purpose in terms of why the organization exists in terms of solving such a, a massive problem for, for the industry. Then you kind of find that that's the thing that gets people out of bed. That's the momentum that gathers. Uh, and actually, I think that really is the secret of it, really, isn't it? I think if you look back, look, if you look back at your career, salary, job title, all of these things become reasonably you know, inconsequential when you're actually solving a problem that really you you love solving. Um, so maybe that's the key. It's uh, do things you love, but it's uh, it's hard to know that when you're in the muck and the mire of uh, building something, isn't it? Exactly. But, but I think the underlying purpose you have and the thing you have to repeat for the next eight years, I've been doing this, right? It, uh, and, and you have to be able to sell to people, um, investors and clients and, and also motivate yourself, right? So I think... Um, I think um, Finding that vocation and, and and kind of calling is like um, critical because um, at the beginning you shape the company and then for the next eight years the company shapes you and you have no real um, way of superseding that control that you've imposed upon yourself. Definitely. Scary ride, but it's a fun one. All right. I'm afraid we're, we've run out of time, so we are going to have to wrap this up. But um, congratulations on everything that you guys have done. Congratulations on the raise. Congratulations on the success so far. You'll definitely have to come back and tell us a little bit more as these things uh, transpire and uh, and as you go from strength to strength. So where can people learn a little bit more about you uh, personally and uh, Compliant Vantage? Um, we are at ComplianceVantage.com. I've taken all the at Delling poll handles on all social media accounts. So, um, but yeah, um, and hopefully you can learn more about us when we're back next on the um, 11FS podcast. Fantastic. All right, guys. Well, that's all the time that we have for this week. Uh, make sure you follow us on, I think, pretty much every social media channel at this st- stage. Just search for 11FS uh, and stay well up to date with all the cool stuff that we're up to. There's loads of different things that we're doing at the moment. Make sure you subscribe to the 11FS YouTube channel where all sorts of videos and everything sits as well. Uh, I hope you enjoyed today's show. Have a great week and we will see you soon. Goodbye. <laughs>